Okay, let's go ahead. It's um, 7.36 according to my watch. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, well, welcome folks. Um, tonight we're going to, um, we're lucky to have uh, Cindy Inman um, with us tonight. She's a registered dietitian and exercise physiologist who is currently an instructor at Southern Illinois University and teaches both undergrad and graduate classes in nutrition. Um, and she's gonna talk about how to optimize your pre, during and post race nutrition. And I think she's got a slide or two about optimizing um, weight in general for athletes. Cindy? Yep, yep. All right, hi everybody. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I found some really fun pictures, but um, so yeah, so Jim said who I am, and this is just sort of a little bit of background um, on my experience. And one of the things that I want to bring up is I'm not one to, to really push a particular food or diet or a lot of specifics, um, mostly because I think diet has to be very individualized. And when I do these talks, I do assume that everybody is healthy um, and you don't have any metabolic disorders or anything like that. So I will have some recommendations and some calculations if you want to do them on yourselves. Um, but really when it comes to diet, I'm, I'm a strong believer that there's no one perfect diet. There's always ways we can each individually improve our diets. Um, but an improvement for my diet will be very different from an improvement in Jim's diet or Amy's diet or anybody's diet, right? Because um, we all eat differently, we all have different goals um, and so forth. So that's kind of my thing. So I don't know if it's a disclaimer, I don't know what you want to call it, but. And certainly interrupt me with, with questions. Um, it's kind of hard on Zoom. I'd much rather be in person and make it more of a discussion. Um, I've been teaching on Zoom now for a year, so I'm, I'm used to it. Doesn't mean I like it, but <laughs> if you have a question, raise your hand or just interrupt me if I'm not seeing you. Um, and we can try to make this more of a discussion since it's a pretty small group. So um, any questions right now? <laughs> Everybody muted. Okay. All right. So really what I wanna cover is some of the, the basics about carbs, proteins, and fats, um, what they do for us, um, and why you want to eat them, why you should have them. So what's a carb, what's a protein, what's a fat, what foods fall into those areas, um, and why they're important. Each one of these things are very important. So again, I'm not one to push a particular diet, but I am one to push a variety of foods and a variety of a diet. Um, so I'm not certainly not one for uh, like a keto diet or uh, something like that where you're knocking out an entire macronutrient, which that's what our carbs, proteins, and fats are, our macronutrients. Um, I'm going to talk about, you know, what to eat, but not necessarily like you need to eat this and that's what's going to make you ride faster or build bigger muscles, but in general, uh, when to eat. And then I'll talk a little bit about recovery. And Again, everybody is different. And so I think, you know, this statement about, you know, your body the best, so you need to pay attention to you really is, is a big deal. So um, also, I don't think it needs to have to, it doesn't have to be complicated. It really doesn't have to be, I think people have made nutrition so complicated and almost uh, a religion. <laughs> like, people get very defensive about how they eat and everybody else should eat this way. And it really doesn't have to be that complicated. And again, I think it needs to be very individualized. Um, okay. All right, so what causes athletes to adapt to whatever you're trying to do? Ride a century, lift heavier weights. What do you have to do to adapt to that athletic goal? Someone. You like my classes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, ad adaptation is is a function of the overload principle. Yeah, you, you have to stress the organism, and and then the response the the organism responds to that stress by, for lack of a better word, uh, adapting the itself to better handle the stress when it is reapplied. Absolutely. So a really good example is you know lifting a weight. Right, you might do bicep curls and maybe you can do, you know, 10 pounds all day long. That's not necessarily going to stress the muscle to adapt to anything. But when you try to lift 50 pounds, it's going to be a lot harder. And you, you do that to, so you have to put stress, that overload on the muscle in order for it to adapt. So 10, let's say 10 pounds is hard. You, you work on that. Pretty soon it becomes easy. So you have to overload it a little bit more and you can overload it by either lifting a heavier weight, doing more reps, some kind of overload. So what's missing in that? Food, right? Like, so you cannot eat something to make you stronger. Now you can eat something to make you train at a better quality. So the, the adaptation really is the training. You have to train to improve your performance. You have to train. So the training is really that direct uh, cause of the adaptation, you know, to occurs directly because of training, but it's indirectly because of nutrition. So the point is, is the better your diet, the better your training, the better you will adapt. Okay, I, what's advertised out there, right? If you drink this drink, you're going to go faster. That's not necessarily the case. If you drink this drink and sit on the couch, you're not going to go faster. If you drink this drink that's really high in protein and sit on the couch, you will not see your muscles grow. You have to do the training part of it. And that seems to be lost in the media or the marketing of all these nutritional products out there. Um, so I want to make that really clear that uh, a better diet and timing of food and recovery and so forth will help you to train better so that next double century isn't as taxing, um, something like that, right? Um, so again, nutrition is really a key component to a higher quality training day after day, uh, week after week, and that's going to lead to your improved performance. Um, it's really important if you're doing, um, you know, two a days, if you're working out in the morning and the evening, then diet's going to play a big role between morning and evening so that you have the best quality training workout in the evening. Um, and then you recover overnight to do the best quality workout in the morning and recover to do the best quality, you know, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Yes. So, go yes. ahead. No, just say yes, that makes sense. Okay, great. All right, so some of the most common nutrition issues in, in athletes, um, in female athletes, it's really just not enough carbs um, or, or and low caloric intake, so under fueling, not eating enough. And that is also going to lead to probably not enough protein. So all of that kind of bunches together. You don't eat enough, you're not gonna get enough carbs and you're not gonna get enough protein. In male athletes, there's a few, and uh, the first one, and these aren't in any particular order, um, they don't drink enough water, so dehydration. Um, in male athletes, they tend to rely more on supplements, and, including energy drinks for fuel, um, and they may be consuming too much protein and not enough carbohydrates. So the issues are similar but slightly different. Some are actually opposite. So, Again, you know, I'm not going to put a blanket over everybody. It's going to be an individual thing to work on with, with people. But these are some of the most common issues in athletes. All right, so what are carbs? So carbs are just this huge umbrella. They're not just sugars. I'm going to move you guys a little bit. I need to... I want to move you over here. Sorry. So... Carbohydrates are not just sugars and, and sugars get a bad rap and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, but carbs in, include fiber, 
They include starches, they include sugars, they include grains, they include, so carbs is a big umbrella. And when people say like, oh, you know, you're eating too many carbs and whatever, I don't, I'm not sure if they mean all of carbs or just sugar or what, because we need fiber, fiber is really important. Most of us probably, most Americans don't need as much sugar as they consume. Um, but there's a time and a place and athletes actually do need sugar at certain times. It's very important so uh, to keep them going. So we'll talk a little bit about that and sugar, but it is important. It's really important to replenish the muscle glycogen stores after a long ride or a really hard ride. Um, I've got a pretty cool um, slide next. I think it's the next slide with the graph that I use in a lot of talks because I think it's great, but as athletes, we do actually need some sugar. We can replenish our muscle glycogen stores quicker with simple carbohydrates or sugars. And that's going to, again, if you replenish those muscle glycogen stores, you're going to be able to work out at a better, higher quality the next workout. You've got to replenish those muscle glycogen stores. So we do need some sugar and like gasp, everybody's afraid of sugar, we do. So there's a time and a place. This is one of my sayings, and this goes with sugar. There's a time and a place, and we'll go into that in a little bit. This is my, gra my graph that I love to show. It's an old study. It's from 1971, but it's been replicated again and again and again. Um, and what they did, is there, can everybody see my cursor? Okay. So what they did, they had, uh, this was on men. Um, they looked at their muscle glycogen concentration um, right here at baseline. They ran 10 miles or 16 kilometers. So this is when they ran. Obviously, you're going to deplete your muscle glycogen stores when you do that run. They had a group uh, replenish their or follow a high carbohydrate diet. And the high carbohydrate diet was about 70% of their calories were coming from carbohydrates. Um, the other group uh, had a low carbohydrate diet, which was about 40% of their calories coming from carbohydrates. Now, if you Think about the keto diet. The keto diet is really low in carbohydrate. It's like maybe 20% of your calories coming from carbohydrate, sometimes lower. Um, but you can see the squares that followed the high carbohydrate diet were able to replenish their glycogen stores almost back to baseline. The low carbohydrate really didn't replenish too well. They ran 10 miles again the next day, dropped their glycogen. These guys dropped even lower and they just couldn't replenish. So you see the low carbohydrate at the end, much lower than baseline. The high carbohydrate was lower, but probably not statistically significantly different. Um, and I think this is really telling. If you think about, again, you guys did a double century. Did all of you guys do the double century? It's on here. A lot of us did. A lot of you guys, so, <laughs> double century, right? You double century, you depleted your glycogen stores the first day. You got to get those up to be able to ride and feel strong and get through the second one. And so if you didn't have any carbohydrate, um, you probably wouldn't feel really great. You might not finish the second century um, or you just didn't have fun because it really hurt. <laughs> You, you, you um, just described me perfectly this weekend, by the way. Okay. <laughs> now, it's not just, you know, okay, I'm going to do a double century and follow a high carbohydrate diet and be fine, right? You got to train for that as well. So, uh, again, there's that, that, uh, that combination, right? So, again, I think this is, I love showing this study graph because it's very, it just shows so much and it just shows uh, such a great point of just uh, follow, you know, having more carbohydrates if you're doing you know, pretty high intensity workouts day after day after day after day and being able to do those workouts at a higher quality. If you're doing workouts and they're not high quality or you're tired or um, you know, you're just fatigued in general, you're at higher risk for injury, um, even illness. Um, so, Again, it all kind of goes hand in hand. And so does it matter with that, like the, um, 
duration of the event. So for example, you, you were talking this weekend doing a double century, but what about something like the Gateway Cup where it's you know four days in a row, much shorter, but much more intense. Is the, the same principles apply or do you adapt them? It, well, it does, yeah, yeah. And especially like Gateway Cup, because when you think about like Friday night, you, you do your race at night and the next day your, work, your, your race may be less than 24 hours later. So it's gonna be really, and I'm gonna talk about recovery um, that's, that's really where recovery and timing of having carbohydrates and protein after the race is, is really going to play into being able to replenish those glycogen stores so that you can race really hard the next day and then the next day and the next day. So there is definitely a, a timing and, um, recovery plays a role in this as well as the timing of the recovery. So we'll get to that. And I think I'll be able to answer that question more thoroughly when we get to recovery. But absolutely, with high intensity, day of, day after day, same thing applies. Um, so that kind of halfway answered it, I hope. <laughs> um, so carbohydrates and proteins work together. Um, carbs are known as protein sparing. And, and what that means is carbohydrates are being used as energy because protein isn't a great source of energy. We really want protein to be used to build and repair the tissue that you've built, that you've broken down in your workout. So when you do your hard ride, whether it's a training ride or, or a race, um, you tear down muscle tissue, and this is that overload. You tear down that muscle tissue, and then you recover, and the tissue heals, and it will heal a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger. Um, and so, but you need protein to be able to do that. And if you don't get enough carbohydrate, our bodies will use protein or the amino acids as energy, therefore taking away the building and the repair of the tissue. So each of these macronutrients has a job per se, and carbohydrates job really is to provide energy. Protein's job is to build and repair that tissue. Again, protein can be used as energy, but it's not a great energy source. And it's really only used when we don't uh, supply enough carbohydrate. So they work together. Um, and, and, and again, I'll do a little, I have a little bit more uh, specifics on recovery, but carbohydrates and protein together um, after the workout, the protein helps is another sort of push to uh, get those carbs into the muscle glycogen stores. So they, they work together that way in recovery. And I, again, I have some separate slides on recovery. All right, so sugars and sports drinks. So um, I'm gonna answer all these questions in the next couple of slides, but why are, why are they important? Uh, when do you need, a, need one when you're riding um, on the bike? When is, when is water all that you need? And what's the best sport drink for you? So really it's kind of a, a three in one deal. So sports drinks contain energy. They contain calories, and typically that energy is from sugar, carbohydrates. They also contain electrolytes, and they also contain flavor. And all together, these will provide glucose so our muscles can keep going. So if you think about it, as you're riding, particularly in the, like the century ride, you're riding, you're, you're burning glycogen. If you're replenishing it at the same rate that you're burning it, that's perfect. That hardly ever happens, but that would be perfect. <laughs> um, so you're replenishing at the same time. So it's balanced. Doesn't usually happen that way, but we can do it. We can, that's our goal to get it that you're replenishing at the same time, same rate that you're burning it. That's a goal. It's hard to do, but that's a goal. So that glucose helps you keep going. Um, the Electrolytes, and uh, they provide minerals to replenish those that are lost in sweat, right? We lose salt, we lose sodium chloride, potassium. Those are replenished in the sport drink. And then the flavor is really important because if you don't like it, you're not going to drink it. And it's important that you like whatever sport drink that you're drinking because then you'll, you, you will actually drink it. So all of these will help prevent dehydration. It'll keep you fueled. Um, and, it's, you know, the theory is to help keep you going strong. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail on sport drinks here. So you want to use a sport drink when it's, when it's particularly when it's really hot and humid, where you're going to be sweating a lot. Um, and or 
if you're doing a ride that's going to last longer than 90 minutes, that's sort of the, the golden rule that's 90 minutes. Um, and then it's really important to, on longer rides to sip often, to have it maybe every 10 to 15 minutes. What happens is, and, and especially like this weekend, the weather was so great. It wasn't hot. It was just so nice. And yesterday was a little bit cooler and terribly windy. Um, but, and you're with your buddies and your friends and you start to talk in and pretty soon it's like two hours have gone by and you've basically taken your bottle of water or sport drink on a ride. Like you've not even touched it. Um, that happens pretty pretty regularly. So it's a good idea to maybe maybe set a timer on one of the computers that you use, maybe your Garmin or your sport watch or something to just beep every 10 or 15 minutes to remind you to take a sip. Um, and I've done, I don't know how many century rides I've done. That's I love to do century rides and I, I've done a lot in my life, but I can tell you. There are times I've done it right and I've done it wrong. There are times when I've done a century and it was weather like this weekend and 30 miles went by and I hadn't taken a drink. And then I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> you really can't catch up at that point. Um, and I felt pretty crappy at the end. Um, there's other times when I, okay, take a drink, take a drink, take a drink. Felt great the whole time. So, you know, I've done everything wrong in the book. So if, if you want any, I've got some good stories and just my forgetfulness and whatnot, because that's what happens, right? You're talking and having fun and you just forget. Um, you don't necessarily get thirsty on a cooler day. So having that timer is, is really important and, and you will definitely feel a difference when you do that. You can use water when it's not particularly hot or humid. If you're doing a shorter or easier ride, that's fine. Um, and even in a crit race, crit races, because they're so intense, um, having a sport drink probably isn't going to do much for you. It's not going to hurt, but you can certainly be fine on water. Um, and the crit race is also, you know, if you're doing a crit race, it's 45 minutes um, and you're, it's so intense, there's not going to be a lot of gastric emptying because the blood is going out to our muscles, to our legs, arms, and whatnot. So there's not going to be a lot to um, a blood supply to the gut to actually absorb that fluid. So in some instance, if you try to drink during a crit, it may just sit there and slosh and you may not feel as good. So in some cases, if it's a shorter crit, I mean, don't even have, you don't necessarily have to have a water bottle on your bike because you may not even reach for it. Um, and then you're just carrying around extra weight, right? <laughs> so in a really short, high intense, it's really gonna be about recovery and making sure you get your, your fluids then at recovery. But it's also very personal, right? If you feel better with having a bottle on your bike, that's absolutely have it, have it. Um, but in the shorter races, like water's gonna be fine. Um, if it's a longer race, you're gonna wanna have some water and some sport drink. Right, so what's the best sport drink? So this is really, really important. It's got to be a drink that tastes good to you. It has to, like, because again, if you don't like it, you're not going to drink it. If, if, if all your friends are drinking this new sport drink that they all love and you don't like it, don't force yourself to try it, to bring it with you because you won't drink it. So it's got to be some, something that tastes good to you. There's also some scientific evidence that, that taste will influence your perception of effort. So if it's something that you like, you may not feel like you're putting out quite as much effort as what you really are. If it's something you don't like, it may, may make you feel like you're putting out more effort than you actually are. So it's in mind that our minds are very powerful. So if you think you're putting out more effort than you actually are, then that's could be the, 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 the reason why you get second instead of first or whatever, right? So it's got to be one that tastes good to you. It has to be a drink that you can tolerate, and that's going to be dependent on the concentration of the carbohydrate. So typically, the best concentration for, for maximal absorption of the fluid and the carbohydrate is a 6% carb solution. Um, and I've got down here, you know, how you would calculate that. Whoops. Um, but Gatorade, for example, is a 5.8% solution. Coke is about 10.8%. 10, 10 
Um, Powerade is a, 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 an 8% solution. It's going to be individual, but, but most evidence and most research says around a 6% is, is the best. Um, but again, if, if you really like something like a Powerade and it's a higher concentration, that's fine. Um, I, I typically will water down. I'm a Gatorade girl. I, I just keep using Gatorade. That's what I like and it works for me, but I water it down. So I, and I don't even know what I water it down to. I just put a little extra water in there. So it's probably, mine's probably more a five and a half percent or maybe 5% solution. So it's going to be what you can tolerate. Um, but here's how you calculate it. You take uh, for the, this was for the calculation for the Gatorade. So you take the number of grams, which is 14 grams and 240 milliliter servings, serving size, and then you multiply that by 100 to get 5.8%. Coke has about 27 grams and a 250 milliliter serving, and that makes it a 10.8%. So that kind of gives you a, an idea of like taste, right? You know how sweet Coke tastes and you know how sweet Gatorade tastes and the difference in the percentage of the the carbohydrate. So again, why 6%? And I've already mentioned that, that most people will absorb more fluid at that concentration. Um, if you go much higher, that can cause uh, the absorption to slow down or even stop. And that can lead to some cramping or other uncomfortable and unfortunate side effects. Um, but it is going to be individual, whatever you like and what you can tolerate. Um, but that's kind of what the research says. All right, uh, any questions at this point? Um, I have one, Cindy, and that is, um, there are a number of, and, and maybe they're not classified as sports drinks and we'll get into it here, but there are a number of very high concentration um, uh, fluids out there that you can like Carbo Pro is one. It's got like 200 calories and a, in a 500 milliliter bottle. Um, I think there's a, there's another outfit, uh, Martin or something like that. They have 320 calories in a 500 milliliter bottle. Um, how does, how does, how effective would those be? Are those marketed for, I'm not, I'm not, I'll be honest. I'm not familiar with those, but are they marketed okay. for a, like a during or after? During. Or during. Um, I'll have to look into them. I'm, I'm not familiar with, send me the names of those and let me look into okay. them. I think that it sounds like it, that would be something more for like an ultra endurance event, like, well, a double century or like ultra marathons and things like that, just to, to get more calories in, in a, in a fluid. The, yeah, I, that's that's the way they're marketing. Okay. So it's not it's not so much as I guess I I it also it's almost like it's a different category. Yeah. The, it's hard a hydration problem. drink as much as it is liquid calories. The Carbo Pro is uh, glucose. It's straight glucose. Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let huh? me. Look that more but it does sound like these are more like um if you're doing an ultra marathon or or whatever where you're gonna need calories um it's easier to get more calories in a liquid form than in a food form it's particularly if you're like you're running right it's even harder because the, the bouncing and whatnot but yeah let me look into that a little bit more and i can send you some information on it um Straight glucose is going to go right into your bloodstream and, you know, so you'll be able to keep going with that, but it may, it may be uh, harder to tolerate. I don't know. I got to look into that. I'm not sure. But I will look into it. Any el anything else at this point? Okay. So how many carbs do people need during a ride? So there's some... Scientific evidence that shows that like during high intensity exercise, there's a lot of studies that we can maximize and, and utilize about 1.2 grams of carbs per minute. So that'd be about 70 grams per hour. And again, remember this is sort of like that whole, 
you're depleting those muscle glycogen stores and you need to drink something or eat something to replenish them at the same time. So if you can do it at this rate, great. <laughs> kind of hard, it is hard to do, but you can, that's sort of the goal. So it's not necessarily that more is better. If you take in more than that, you could have some stomach cramping. Um, but again, as I mentioned before, like having that sport drink regularly, maybe every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes while you're riding. Um, and I'll, I've got a, some examples of just like, what is 70 grams per hour? So it's about a liter of sport drink, um, 20 ounces of cola drink, one and a half power bars, three bananas. I'm not saying eat three bananas every hour, just giving you an idea of about 70 grams in a, in a bulk, right? So you could have, it's, it's very doable. If you take sips and drinks of sport drink throughout that hour, you can get about a liter of sport drink. Or if you want to have, you know, a power bar or cliff bar or something like that with your sport drink and some water, the point is just having something regularly throughout that hour each hour. Does that make sense? So if you can get in 70 grams of carbs consistently, so not just like I'm going to down this 70 grams at every hour on the hour, that may not work out as well, but having it throughout that hour is going to be important. So again, it's kind of like this goal of replenish as you're burning and balancing it. I'm going to move on to protein. Do you have any other questions about carbohydrate at this point? Doesn't sound like it. So, so there's a classic debate on how much protein do, do we need. And there's one of the issues is the, the, the studies will use various populations. They'll study uh, people who are sedentary, active, during different activities. Um, a lot of studies have been done mostly on men. There's beginning to be more and more studies on women. So there's this classic debate and um, we're still trying to figure it out, I'll be honest with you. A lot of the recommendations are ranges um, and I'll kind of give you my bottom line in, in just a second, but really again, the, the main job of protein is to build and repair tissue, like I mentioned. Um, really, we can only um, use about 20 to 25 grams of protein at a time, like per meal or per snack. Um, and so about 20 to 25 grams is some examples of, of what that is. So two cups of coffee about, or not coffee. Ooh, I need some coffee. Two cups of milk, um, two cups of yogurt, some peanut butter, three ounces of beef, chicken, turkey, three eggs. So, so each one of these contains about 20 to 25 grams of protein. Um, and again, with about, if you have 20 to 25 grams of protein spread throughout the day, that's gonna work better for you for building and repairing that tissue. Um, instead of like, and I'll give you some, so here's some, some of the math, here's some of the math, right? So a sedentary person needs about 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. And to convert pounds to kilograms, you divide your pounds by 2.2. And there's your weight in kilograms. So if you're 150 pounds, you're actually 68 kilograms. And if you were sedentary, you would really only need about 55 grams of protein. So it's not that much. Um, an active endurance person who's training needs anywhere from 1.2 to 1.4, maybe up to two. Um, there's some evidence uh, heavy, heavy weight lifters for a short period of time may need up to three grams per kilogram, but it's not, it's a short period of time. So anywhere, so, so 1.2 to 1.4 for the same 150 pound person is anywhere from 82 to 95 grams of protein per day. Um, an active resistance training person would need a little bit more, 1.4 to 1.7. So that puts us up to 95 to 115 grams a day. So, these are just some examples. And my point of spreading it out is, is if somebody said to you, okay, you need 95 grams of protein a day, um, you wouldn't want to just do it all in breakfast and be done with it. Um, it's, it's not, you won't be able to utilize it the best. So you need to spread those 95 grams out throughout the day. So this is 
kind of going back to just really reiterating, which I haven't mentioned, but I think this kind of goes back to what, you know, our moms and grandparents would say, like, three square meals, right? Breakfast, lunch, dinner, maybe some snacks and spreading out our carbs and spreading out our protein. Um, and that really is, is very optimal for us, um, particularly with uh, as being an athlete. So, so protein really, you know, and protein, if you're a vegetarian, it's, it's very easy to get enough protein. You can combine foods to get enough protein. Proteins are made up of amino acids. And so pretty much everything has amino acids in it, except for pure, pure fat. Pure fat doesn't have any protein in it, but combining foods uh, where you're getting all the, uh, the essential amino acids, um, there's your protein for you. So it's, it's pretty easy as a vegetarian. I don't know if there's any vegetarians in the audience here, but um, it's actually pretty easy to get enough protein. Um, typically it's not um, necessary to use a protein supplement. I don't think there's harm to using a protein supplement if they're used appropriately. Um, I was working with a guy that was doing sprint triathlons and, and um, he, he, did, he gave me his uh, food journal and he was taking a, 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 like a whey protein or something. And he was, instead of using one scoop and typically one scoop of a, a protein powder to put in a smoothie or whatever has anywhere from 20 to 25 grams of protein. And he was putting three scoops in and he was drinking three of these a day. And he, he was getting a massive, he was getting like 350 grams of protein a day. I was like, okay, I can save you a lot of money. <laughs> like, because those protein powders are really expensive. And so, um, so like, you, you don't need to do three scoops. I mean, he was, it was a massive amount of protein. So, um, yeah, anyway, that's one of my funny stories about protein. The questions about protein, I am going to bring up protein again with recovery. Okay, so fats, I just kind of gloss over fats kind of quickly because really they are important, but they sort of tend to be the, the fill in the blanks, right? Uh, our main thing that we are concerned about is carbs and protein and then whatever calories that we need left over, we want to use with fats. So fats are important. They, they, they make our food taste better. Um, there's two essential fatty acids, which essential means you have to get them in our diet. Um, so it's important to include fat in your diet so that you make sure you get those two essential fatty acids. Um, uh, we use fats as energy during low, very low intensity activities. So hiking and gardening, Jim and I were talking about gardening earlier. Um, but we don't use a ton. Like right now, as we sit, we are mostly burning fat right now. We're not burning a lot because we know sitting and it's not necessarily a weight loss mechanism, right? But right now we are burning mostly fat as we sit here. Um, in general, the recommendation for fat is to get about 20 to 35% of your calories from fats. Um, I recommend getting mostly unsaturated fats. So these are fats that are liquid at room temperature. So olive oil, canola oil, those types of things. Um, the MCTs, the medium chain triglycerides, um, these can be quicker oxidized so we can use them as an energy source quickly. But right now there's not a lot of evidence that um, MCTs will uh, improve performance. Um, and another point, which I, my students know this, um, Coconut oil is not an MCT. <laughs> I, I talk about this a lot. MCT is created from coconut oil, but coconut oil itself is not an MCT. So um, that's a, a really important point. So uh, coconut oil is actually considered a saturated fat. Um, and a saturated fat is a fat that's solid at room temperature. You want to keep uh, your, your saturated fat intake to no more than 10% of your total calories in, in a day. Um, but MCTs are, are bought in a bottle at a supplement store, and they are made from extracting particular MCTs from coconut oil. The coconut oil itself 
Um, there's one MCT they don't take out that's about 45% of coconut oil, and it acts more like a longer chain fatty acid that's not very healthy for us. So that's important to, to keep in mind. If there's a, a, if you read a research study about MCT, it's about MCT. It is not about coconut oil. So I like coconut oil for like skin, but not eat. So. <laughs> Um, all right, so recovery. I don't know if you can see my picture. I love, this is my favorite picture, my recovery picture. Can you guys see my guy? I thought that was perfect for recovery. That, that's me. Yeah, <laughs> it might be you guys after the double century, yeah. So with recovery, um, recovery is really important to make sure you're refueling as soon as you can after your training or your event. Um, so anywhere between zero hours post exercise and two hours. So, you know, right when you get done to two hours after you're done is really when you want to try to get carbs, get protein to start replenishing those muscle glycogen stores, repairing that tissue that you've damaged. Um, we used to really push the within 30 minutes. Um, and I, I just read a study recently that that may not be as important anymore. So we're sticking to the zero to, to two hours post is, a, is sort of the sweet, sweet spot time. Um, and so this is really the time when a high glycemic index food would be very helpful to an athlete. So these are the simpler sugar, sugars. These are the, the foods that will turn into glucose really quickly. Um, and I've got a chart for you in just a second, but the high GI foods, glycemic index foods will raise your blood sugar really fast, but that will then in turn get into your muscle cells quicker. Um, and so glucose, so you were just talking about that product that is pure glucose, that's, that's gonna be, because the GI food list is all compared to glucose. So, um, so that's gonna, Glucose in a sport drink, uh, in fruits and sugars and milk and those types of things will raise your blood sugar quicker, but that means it's gonna go into your blood cell faster, your blood cells faster and your muscle glycogen source. So here's a chart and um, you might have to move our faces around a little bit to see. Um, and this certainly doesn't list everything, but again, glycemic index foods, these are gonna be foods that are carbohydrates, right? You're not gonna see meat on here. You will see the hamburger bun, but not the hamburger itself, because there is no carbohydrate in hamburger. Um, so typically we, we really push for, for most people to have the low glycemic index foods. So these are foods that are higher in fiber. Um, and for a sedentary person, they need more fiber. Um, typically more fiber will help people to, to eat less food. So that may uh, help. Uh, lower the obesity rate and so forth. But as an athlete, when you're exercising and when you're done exercising, having a high glycemic index food is actually quite helpful. So over here, you know, bagels, um, watermelon, honey, mashed potatoes. So all these numbers are compared to glucose. Glucose has a number of 100 and these numbers, and so they're, they're basically how quickly will they raise your blood sugar? Um, so having high glycemic index foods after exercise is, is actually pretty important. Um, and so this is where I go back to my saying, there's a time and a place. There's, uh, you know, we hear like, you know, even on this, this chart that I found, right? The, this one's red, red, and usually red means don't have a whole lot, which in general, for most people, you don't want to have a whole lot of that. We really push the higher fiber stuff and the, the green, the green means go, have more of these. Um, but again, there's a time and a place. And uh, so after your first century, you would want some of these to get your, your glycogen stores replenished so that the next day you can go out and feel really ready to go. <laughs> so, um, all right, so with that, with recovery, having some of those carbohydrates with some protein 
during that zero to two hours post exercise, um, there, there's some evidence, you know, in this four to one ratio of carbs to protein, some studies say two to one carbs to protein uh, seems to be most advantageous. Um, some examples are like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, even like a turkey sandwich. So if you think about it, the bread, you've got your carbohydrates in the bread, um, the protein from turkey or from the peanut butter, there may be some sugar in the peanut butter, um, and then the jelly, some sugar in that. So there's that, that, that combination of protein and, and carbohydrate. Um, chocolate milk, that seems to be like the favorite recovery drink, but, but it actually is pretty perfect if you think about it. There's natural sugars in the milk, so the carbohydrate there, there's protein in the milk. You add some chocolate, you're adding a little bit more carbohydrate to it. And most people really like chocolate milk. Um, so that seems to be a really popular one. I know in our university, that's like in all of the athlete at the nutrition center, they got chocolate milk there for them and they've got chocolate soy milk for those that are lactose intolerant or almond milk. Um, all works the same. So you've got that combination of the carbs and the protein. What's the right fat content then? I mean, is it low fat or whole milk or what's, does it matter? Um, it doesn't really matter, but for recovery, uh, low fat's probably going to be more uh, easier to digest and a little bit easier on the stomach. So low fat is, is uh, probably better tolerated. Um, they also have, so they, you know, the, the soy milk, the almond milk, the um, oat milk, and any of those things, that those are going to be, um, that combination will, will work fine. And also the fact that it's a fluid and it's liquid, it's easier. Sometimes it's easier for people to, to be able to tolerate a fluid, particularly after a really hard workout, than sitting down and having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. They may be able to tolerate that fluid better. Um, but again, it's individual. Um, you do yogurt and fruit, quinoa. Quinoa is a great uh, grain because it has uh, all of the essential amino acids in it. So it's, it's a two for one right there. You got your carbs and your protein just in a bowl of quinoa. Um, you do smoothies, you can, you know, any kind of combination will, will work great with that recovery. So I have this one slide for, for weight loss and weight management. And um, what one of the things is really important is the second point here that if you need to drop weight or want to drop weight, you have to take in fewer calories than you need. And the issue with this is if you're trying to train really hard and you're cutting calories, that goes back to not having the highest quality training that you possibly can have. So weight loss really is best during off season. So you don't jeopardize your training. Um, or if you know if you're you want to do it at a very slow rate, uh, you cut calories very very not as 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 much, and so that you can keep on training as as high quality as possible. Um, but that really is the the thing. You have to burn more calories than you take in, or take in less, or whatever. So that combination of little a fewer calories, exercising, weight loss will occur. Um, and typically for most people, when they think about weight loss, they're trying to lose fat, right? You don't want to lose muscle, you're trying to lose fat. So you still need to keep training to retain the muscle that you want to keep um, and do good exercise to burn the fat. So um, snacks after workouts are going to be important. Um, recovery is going to be really important and, and uh, with rest, but eating correctly during recovery so that you can train hard and so forth. Typically, when I talk about weight loss and weight management with, with athletes, I really try to push like wait till the off season and let's, you know, then really focus on the weight loss at that point. Um, again, because of training and potential injury issues, if you're not getting enough calories, um, people that are cutting calories when they're training really hard can really hit plateaus. They're not going to improve their training and their weight isn't going to make move. And so they just get frustrated. And so then it becomes a mental game. So kind of timing it and, and doing it on the off season is the, the best time for that. 
So here's my general guidelines. Um, eat when you're hungry, eat slowly, and stop when you're full. This, this kind of goes back to mindful eating. I'm, I'm really big on that and just really enjoying your food. Um, really push trying to get you know five fruits and vegetables a day. Um, it's a little bit harder in the winter time, but we're moving into spring and we're gonna be able to get more fruits and more than just bananas and oranges and apples. So that's a great thing. Um, eat a variety of food, spread your protein throughout the day, just like I mentioned before. Depending on your training and if you really want some numbers, um, anywhere from five to 10 grams of carbs per kilogram per day. Um, if you calculate 10 grams of carbs uh, per kilogram, it's a huge amount. That's a lot. But that's that's going to be on days when you're training really hard um, or uh, really long, um, long rides day after day after day, that kind of thing. It ends up being a lot of carbs if you, if you do that. So there's, the, there's a huge range. It's going to depend on how much you're doing. Because remember, those carbs are providing the energy. So what is the energy cost? Are you doing a half an hour spin? Or are you doing a six hour century? You're going to need different carbs amounts, right? Protein, anywhere from 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilogram. And then fats, that broad range of 20 to 35% of your total calories. Um, and most people don't really need to think about that. If you cook with oils and so forth, you'll probably be fine. It's not something that you really need to calculate. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily worry about that. I think I have, yeah, this, so I think this is my last slide here, but you're gonna, you know, sports nutrition is not constant. It's gonna change with your training. It's gonna change with your goals. Um, and you need to adjust your diet accordingly. Um, you may need to adjust your diet if, uh, I think, Amy, is Amy still on? I don't even know if she's on here. I think she's the only other female on here, but with women, they may do, may do to adjust with their cycle. Um, uh, you're gonna need more carbs and protein when you're doing longer and higher intensity training. You're gonna need less in the off season or on days and weeks when you're training light. Um, really, you need to follow your plan. You need, that's no two people are alike, so follow your plan. Um, and then keep remembering that those adaptations to training are because of the training um, and your high quality training can be achieved when your diet is really um, carefully considered and planned with your training. And then going back to weight loss, that really needs to occur in the off season. So I think that is my last slide. Yeah. So hopefully everybody's still awake. I don't know, but. Yep. Questions you guys have? So, any comments on um, looking at the at the uh, people who are online here? Um, changes over time with regards to going into your 60s, 70s, and 80s on protein. Um, you need to maintain it. You definitely need to maintain that high, a little bit higher level, because as we age, we we it's we lose muscle, unfortunately. And so um, I, I really push, you know, some type of resistance training for, for maintaining muscle, but you're going to need to keep that higher level of protein. So I would definitely stay at no less than one gram per kilogram um, and, and maintain, to help maintain that muscle. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. All right, I've got one. Um, what about, uh, I seem to have problems with um, finding a good balance of, uh, with, with my salt intake. Okay. Um, and um, like, I, I feel like I don't, I don't have a, a, I know what works for me before I go on a ride. I mean, after years and years and years of racing, like you said, it's individual, you kind of know what works for you, but it seems like all hell breaks loose after I'm done. And then it's, I, I just start grabbing for anything I can get my, my hands on. It's not necessarily the, the best thing, but I, I tend to crave salt more. What does salt do to your, um, to your, uh, uh, what should I say, to your desire to have what's really best for you? Well, does salt interfere with your 
with your desire to have like the, the better foods that you should be choosing? Um, weird. I like, I like after a, a I'll eat pickles. Yeah. <laughs> But then it's salt and it's not doing much for me, but then it fills me up and then I'm done, you know, and I'm not really gotten anything out of it except for a, a boatload of salt. <laughs> but usually, you know, typically people will crave salt um, when obviously you've lost some sodium and some chloride. Salt will help you retain fluid. So if you're dehydrated and you're taking in some salt, you're pickles and you're drinking or whatever, your base, your body's probably craving it to rehydrate you. Um, so, you know, our body, this is homeostasis. Our bodies are pretty amazing organisms. And so if you're dehydrated, you're going to crave salt um, and get that fluid up. So you're going to need that fluid and you're going to need that salt to it'll be work hand in hand. Now, for a lot of people that are sedentary, they're eating a lot of salt and they're retaining fluid, they see it in their ankles, right? Um, but as athletes, you know, salt's gonna be an important thing. And that is one thing that is in sport drinks is salt. Um, and some people who sweat excessively, and I don't think, Amy, you're an excessive sweater, but um, those that ex sweat excessively, sometimes they have to add salt to their sport drink. They have to add or salt to their sport drink. Again, it's an individual thing. So I don't know if you've tried that or done anything with that, Aim. Yeah, I do. I, I, I sometimes, spring, I'm a Gatorade girl too. So I, uh, lemon lime does it for me, but I'm, I usually sprinkle just a couple, just, you know, a little pinch in my Gatorade of salt. Okay. And I don't, I can tolerate the taste because I like salty things. So, yeah. um, but still like like you said like these in this double century i think i am appalled at how little i drank yeah which is which is contributing to how crappy i feel right now yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> it is right i mean it, it happens but it does that's what happens right it was nicer weather it wasn't that hot you guys are all like talking and having a great time and then you're like oh my god i haven't had a sip and four hours. <laughs> True. So I do have another question though, too, not that this involves me, but I do see in the industry that I work in, obviously I, I do see people trying a host of diets against yeah. our better judgment. But, um, have, do, have you known, are there cases where, um, I mean, like, can us, can somebody who partakes in the keto, uh, the whole keto, um, you know, revolution um can they are they gonna be able to sustain an, a high endurance lifestyle not very many people can it's not impossible but um it it is a very hard uh, diet to follow forever um there are some people that that do do it um and are they can do it, but as most people just can't. And if somebody's doing it for weight loss, um, there's all kinds of evidence where people have followed a keto diet versus just cutting calories. Keto will drop weight faster at first but their weight will creep back up. So at, at the year point, the weight loss is the same, Ooh. Whether, whether it's just cutting calories or keto. And probably the people that followed the cutting calories were much happier than the people that were doing keto. <laughs> <laughs> so it's they, weren't, they weren't kicking their dog and <laughs> yelling at their kids and... Well, <laughs> It just seemed like when that first came on the scene, it was like everybody, not everybody, people were jumping on the keto bandwagon. And yeah. then and, and then after like even only a week, some people were like, I can't do it anymore. I just can't do it. Like it's their, their energy yeah. had plummeted. Yeah. They call it the keto flu. And yeah, the only ones that I've seen use keto that 
actually had some success where basically it had to be in keto denial the day before, the day of, and the day after the race. <laughs> Yeah. So with keto, when you first do it, I mean, you cut out all your carbs. So you've lost all your muscle glycogen is gone. And so you're walking around in this fog, <laughs> right? And, it and so appealing. And you feel like crap. You do. And, but people are like, oh, if you could just get through that, if you can get through that, then you're, yeah. you'll, be, you'll be golden. And so again, psychologically, what happens for people is, okay, I'm going to do this. And you know, Susie was able to do it so I can do this. And then you can't. So then it's like this failure. And so psychologically that really, that really messes with people. Like they failed, they couldn't do it. And so again, it's like, let's just find something that's going to work for you. That's, that's, you know, that, that you're happy doing, that you like the food that you're eating. Um, and, and you can, you can do it, but, and, and then it, when I should, you know, show people the evidence of like, look, at a year point, the weight loss is exactly the same. Um, why go through the pain of keto? <laughs> it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I mean, people can, there are some people that can do it, but it is, it is hard. It's hard. The ones that are, are cheating. Probably. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Yeah. Cindy, have you seen, have you seen any studies? Um, I've read some things that weren't necessarily studies that suggested that um, during events, um, eating a combination of complex and simple carbohydrates, where the simple high carbohydrates would be burnt almost immediately. Um, and the complex carbohydrates would be burnt over time, time being the time of the event itself. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen any studies that would suggest that that was true or not? Um, I don't think I have, but I think what that's coming from is um, there's now and this isn't really new, new, my dog is whining. I'm sorry if you hear that, that's my dog. I'm not beating her, she's just old and wants to go out. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so, um, this isn't really new news, but uh, now the sports drinks, now you've kind of, if you go to the sports drink aisle, right? You've got the pre, the during and the post and they have different amounts of carbohydrate and different types of carbohydrate. And so the during carbohydrate uh, drinks now have a combination of fructose and, and glucose. And that, that helps sustain and you can, and fructose is actually a longer acting carbohydrate than the glucose. So that helps sustain and you can burn and oxidize more, or sorry, absorb more um, quicker. So probably those I don't know if there's studies on that and I'll, I'll look into that because that's really interesting, but I'm, I'm guessing that's where that kind of came from is those dip, that combination of different carbohydrates. It makes sense to me that that would, that would be, um, that that might actually work, but I'm not sure if like a, a really complex carbohydrate is, would be suitable for a lot of people's guts because there's going to be higher fiber. So I just don't know if that would actually, if very many people would be able to tolerate that. Another question, um, and this is, I've read this once again, not in a study, and I've also seen it in, re in, in real life, um, is that if you, for the average person, whatever average is, is you have 90 minutes of glycogen stored in your muscles and liver, about 90 minutes of glycogen. Um, and I've, I've coached a couple of athletes that over time, in the absence of any fueling during a race, I mean, it's pretty close to clock, clockwork. It's at 90 minutes, it's just like they got their, their tank is completely empty. It's not like they're cramping. It's not like, you know, it's, it's, it's not like they're hurting anymore. It's just, they have no gas. 
then. Yeah. Yeah. Have you have you read? I mean. Well, I think it depends. It depends on intensity and whatnot. But there's, um, I I have a reference, um, a bunch of studies on again on fueling and how important it is with the timing and so forth. Um, but yeah, I mean, ninety minutes. I mean, just for a broad number, ninety minutes is that's a good number to use. Um, and if you think about like the one slide I had about you know. Gracie, I don't know if you can hear her, but she's just, ah. um, there's, uh, you know, if you're doing uh, something that's going to last more than 90 minutes, then you use a sport drink, right? So if it's less than 90 minutes, then you probably don't necessarily need a sport drink. So that 90 minutes is sort of that number or time. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I got something to say. Yes, yeah, she does. What else? I hope this was helpful. Very helpful. Um, if nobody else has any questions, Cindy, thank you very much. I got one. Okay. Uh, I'm late, late getting on today, but uh, where, where's uh, nuts and nut butter come in at along this line? Where does nuts and nut butter? Yeah, as far as dietary. Yeah, so those are really kind of categorized in the protein. So we were talking, I talked about carbs, proteins and fats. And so pretty much like the nuts and the nut butters are, are, are considered a protein. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of peanut butter myself. So I like peanut butter, um, and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or whatever after um, for recovery. Um, but yeah, peanut butter and any kind of nut butter is a good, good source of protein. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I got, got one more. Um, I'm 83, so what, how does that change the percentages of what, what you're talking about as far as the carbs and the protein and all the other, how, how do, how should I adjust those or not? Well, I, you definitely want to keep, keep a higher, a little bit higher protein intake. So, so, you know, on that, no, no, grace, less than one gram per kilogram body weight. Um, which is on that one slide. I don't know when you came on, so I don't know if you saw the protein slide at all. Um, but yeah, for for older for all of us older individuals, we need to keep up our protein and and keep doing resistance training to maintain our muscle, along with our cycling and everything else. But resistance training is going to be helpful to maintain muscle. But really, um, fats the the amount of fats in our diet stays the same. Uh, 20 to 35 percent of your calories and your carbohydrates are basically the same you're going to adjust by how active or inactive you're going to be that day or week or or whatever okay okay <laughs> i know over over time it's uh, my muscles have been building up but it's a lot slower than when i was younger Oh yeah. Yeah. Age. Yeah. It's harder to maintain. And so therefore it's going to be really hard to build muscle. So as we get older, every decade, it gets harder and harder and harder. So um, yeah, I, it's just like that consistency is, is going to be super important. Okay. Thanks. Anything Anybody else? else got any questions? Okay, well, once again, Cindy, thank you. Um, if anybody, if anybody wants to get in touch with Cindy, um, you know, to talk about any of these subjects in more detail, um, you can get in touch with her through our website at www.powerupcycling.com uh, and just go to the team. She's part of our team. 
And um, yeah, this has been great. Good. Thank you very much. What's your good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Have a good night. Bye. -bye. Bye.